Alright, so if everyone's ready, I'm going to get started. For this lecture, I'm going to be talking about the metadynamics method, which is another rare event method, like Benoit and uh, Aaron were talking about earlier. And uh, however, metadynamics takes a very different approach to the problem. Instead of specifically trying to sample a rare event, it sees the problem as sampling too many common events. So you're going to try to stop sampling common events rather than trying to directly sample rare events. So the outline of this talk right here. We're going to start introducing the bare bones of metadynamics. Then talking about examples from the literature to get your imagination going from how you can apply this in your own research. And then talk about a lot of thought experiments to give you an intuition of how the method is really working at the smallest level and really understand why we consider it a multi-scale method, understand how the scales involved in the method are connected to the scales involved in the problem. And so the essence of metadynamics can be pretty quickly encapsulated in three lines. Go to bias away from previously visited configurations. Stop sampling common events so you can start sampling rare events. You want to do it only in a reduced space of collective variables. So when you say an event, you're talking about a protonation or a deprotonation, say. You don't care which proton it is. You only care about the protonation state, not about the protonation by proton 170. Okay. So you're going to look at a reduced space of collective variables, just like an umbrella sampler, which we talked about earlier. And also, to sequentially decrease the rate of bias. So every time you see an event, you want to bias away from that less than you biased away from the previous one. Right. And the focus of this talk is going to be less on my personal research, the work in this center that we're doing on metadynamics, and more on giving you a solid foundation to understand the method and apply it to before reading it. I will mention it. My focus will be on the basics, these intuitive thoughts. So let me go into the essence here. Bare bones of it. Really the idea that you shouldn't be trying to sample rare events necessarily, rather no longer sampling common events, was introduced by Hubert Torda and by Gunster in the early 90s as the local elevation method, not metadynamics. And this had the idea that metastable states are the problem. Metastable states are what are responsible for these rare events. The problem is that we're not getting out of a metastable state. So we need to accelerate the transitions in order to observe the simulation. Because our simulation time scales are just now getting to microseconds. And the rare events that we would like to see are often on millisecond or second time scales. Um, longer in glasses. All right, so here's a very simple potential energy surface that you could imagine trying to see a brownie walker move across. You have a 15 kT barrier. If you just simulate this brownie dynamics, even if you're just running a single walker on this one deep potential surface, it will take you a long time to work something. Like that. um, and that's obviously basic. So the local elevation method's suggestion was that you don't necessarily know what the metastable state is, but whatever the metastable state is, we can escape it by biasing ourselves away from where we have already been. Wherever we are stuck, that is where the metastable state is. And what we can do is add an energy hill sensor here. And I'll show you what this looks like. Wherever we sample, and we slowly push ourselves out of this well until we see a transition, and then keep on doing it back and forth. So we have our little walker going back and forth, adding hills until we start making a potential flat. We have a flat potential that is simply sampling with a random walk, it's much faster than this. The barrier is exponential at the very height. 
the smaller the better your height, obviously, the much better you're going to do jump something. And so this method was introduced before. Unfortunately, they were using a lot of variables at once, a lot of fine grained variables. So they were studying things like cyclic peptide antibiotics. And um, it didn't catch up. The method was not widely used. It has been cited frequently, but it was usually cited as one of the many free energy methods that you could possibly use, but we're not going to do it. Um, all right. So the actual equation here, just add a hill, you have a height, you have a Gaussian, you have a width of the Gaussian, delta S, you have a state which you're currently at, you have a sigma of t which is your trajectory, which is S value, so this takes a value of a state at every time t, and you add a little bit of bias, which is the Gaussian center of the graph, probably this height in this one. Now, if you want to think about it in an ideal sense, you want these hills to be very, very small, you want to only bias away from the state you've actually seen, then you take the width here down to zero, this hill becomes a delta function, and the height and the width get folded into a single parameter, which is just the rate of energy that you're adding to your system. And when you think about it this way, uh, a lot of the asymptotics become clear, so a lot of the performance gains become clear. And specifically, it tells you that when you're trying to escape a square well, a very idealized a stable state, all you have to do is fill it up. You're filling it at a constant rate, omega. So you only need a linear amount of time to fill up your well, instead of needing the exponential time to escape it with a free event, an unbiased event. So that's a huge gain. It's as if you could suddenly make your student loans stop compounding interest. It would be a huge win. So this is very attractive, but on the other hand, as I was saying, it could catch up. What had to happen was the, change, the focus of the method had to change. Instead of just trying to explore more and sample any rare event, they needed to focus down on specific rare events that they wanted to study. If you just try to sample everything in a flat plane, so let me go back to that. If you just try to flatten that, if you imagine putting it in more and more dimensions, then you're going to be doing a lot more work. The amount of work you're doing to sample everything is scaling down with the dimension exponentially. So, very expensive. Also, the gain you have for making a random walk, if you're assuming this is approximately round, is less and less with more and more variables. The asymptotics of a random walk in high dimension are very close to the asymptotics of a random walk. Um, sorry, the asymptotics of a self-avoiding random walk are very close to the asymptotics of a random walk when you go to high dimension. So this is this self-avoidance is specifically useful in low dimensions. Um, and also, the higher dimension, the more important it is to focus, because there's so much else to see, so you don't just want to do this indiscriminate sampling on everything. So, Lau and Perinello, in 2002, introduced the metadynamics method as an adaptation of the local elevation method, which was specifically focused on identifying and escaping states along only a few variables of interest. So here you imagine that you have a 2D surface like this. We have a well and a well and a barrier in the middle. On this side of the well, we can imagine that it can easily explore the whole phase space. And on this side of the well, we can easily go right over here. But we can't easily go across. Now, if we want to fill the entire surface, that's going to scale as an area of this. But on the other hand, if we can just fill along the x direction, then that's scaling as a line. So this is a big game. You're turning what was an area into a line. As you go to higher dimensions, you're turning volumes into areas or lines. And then you 
turn hyper volumes down into much lower dimensional surfaces, which are much easier to see. So you only monitor the state determining variables. So usually we know that our reaction with basins can be differentiated based on, say, uh, whether or not the protein has opened or closed, or whether or not a proton is close to or far away from a protonatable residue. So then, let me go a little bit more into what a collective variable is. We've been talking about them all morning, but I'm not sure anybody just went through the zoo of what you can do with these. A collective variable is really a fancy name for any, any function of any number of binary variables. All that's important is really that there are a few of them and that you're focused on those few. So here are ones that have been used in the past. This is not exhaustive. A position of a single atom can be a collective variable, which is kind of hard to think of when you just think of the word collective variable, but it's true. Or a distance, an angle, a dihedral. All these things we think of as fine grained variables can also be used as collective variables. Um, for more material science applications, we consider coordination modes. Consider densities, crystalline order parameters. For more biochemical, biomolecular systems, we talk about helicities, contact maps, NMR spectra. There are far more. And then another thing we can do is get a string from one of these string methods that was introduced earlier. We can get all those configurations and try to construct. Uh, system of variables in which that string is just a straight line. Right. And then we use those variables as our collective variables. It's really just whatever you would like to see. So with that, we were able to explore quite a bit of physics. They were able to see a lot of rare events that they were interested in. However, it had limited accuracy. And the accuracy was seen to be model independent. So here we see four different models, all of which were sampled with metadynamics, and then all of which had the same final error. In the, end. the error is this shaded region. It didn't matter what the peaks looked like, you still got this error, and it never went away. They did notice, though, that the residual inaccuracy, that error, was proportional to the rate that they were adding hills, and also inversely proportional to the width of the hill, so it's smaller than the row. Um, the more narrow the hill, the more this error would show up. So a solution that they came up with was to slow the bias rate. So if you'd like to Imagine starting metadynamics from a biased simulation. It will still flatten out whatever that biased simulation had as its PM. So what they realized they could do was do metadynamics with a fast hill rate, stop it, use that bias as input for another metadynamics with a slower hill rate, and then they would get less error. Then they realize that they could actually do it smoothly, adaptively, within a single simulation. <coughs> so you just slow the bias rate sequentially as you're running the same simulation. It's just like that sequential process. Um, but you can do it intrinsically and get the model in So you don't have to watch it. It will do it automatically for you. And here's an example of what that looks like. So you still have growing. You see that that bump in the center is a little bit lower than it was. It's just slowly rising. And the equation that they use to do this in this paper, well tempered by dynamics, introduced six years after that dynamics was. Uh, they have the same hill, so H times the Scousian. But now they multiply the height by a factor which decreases as you increase the bias that's already at that point. 
Okay, so if you've seen it before, you bias away from that point less than if you hadn't seen it before. Keep on doing that more and more see. If you take it down to the delta function, it's this. And if you take it down to this delta function, you see that instead of trying to make the bias completely flat, you actually get something where the bias is flat except for this factor. And it actually exactly scales the free energy by a constant everywhere. So it flattens it as if you were raising the temperature, but only for the collective variables. So one more thing to know about this is that when you're decreasing this, you're no longer increasing at a constant rate. You're no longer adding energy at a constant rate. It's decreasing. So now, instead of having a um, constant increase, you now have a logarithmic increase. Now, if you have a logarithmic increase in a square well, you're back to having an exponential escape rate from your well. But on the other hand, you're now sampling as if you were at a much higher temperature. So instead of completely stopping your student loans from compounding, it's as if you were now getting a much better rate. So if you were just able to cut the rate by a factor of, say, 10, which is still a huge rate. Right. This may not be necessary. Um, in research that we've been doing, we have invented some other rules for decreasing this, which allow you to get linear increase right up until you see the transition you want to see, and then you start decreasing it during the water thing. So then it's as if you get to defer the interest for a long time, and then get a better rate, um, which is the idea. More like what it's going to for you. All right, so with that, this is the basics of meta-dynamics. You are trying to avoid places you've already been trying to say the, what place you've been by an address, which is only a few collective variables, instead of by everything else that's going on. And you're decreasing the rate that you're doing it so that you can get arbitrary accuracy instead of having an error that saturates. All right. So with that, now I'll go into some good concrete examples just to uh, show you really what this can be for. I'm going to take them from five different domains. First, just a chemical reaction in a condensed phase. In a phase transition, which will be more interesting to you than the, uh, the materials community. Interfacial chemistry. This will be a biological example for interfacial chemistry. It should also be interesting to both bio and materials communities. And the protein function. So a specific, um, specific mechanisms of a protein which don't require too much to go on for the protein to occur. And then the protein fold. So where you have it, so you really have to explore a wide range of the phase space. So let me begin with the chemical reaction. It's often hard to motivate these examples. Because a lot of times, if you want to know how fast a chemical reaction is going, or which one will go faster than another, you can just do the experiment. So I like this example because it explains why you can't always just do the experiment. You're studying a chemical weapon, the external gas. Uh, so in this paper, we're studying the oxidation of the external gas, two different versions. One is an American version, the other is a Russian version, by hypochlorite, so bleach. So how can you validate that your chemical weapon remediation program will actually get rid of all this stuff without endangering your experimental process? And so as collective variables to examine this reaction, they chose two distances. They knew they wanted to look at oxidation, and it was involving the hypochlorite. This is a chlorine, this is an oxygen. The oxygen going through two centers that they suspected could be oxidized. Those were a nitrogen and a sulfur here. So these two distances are the collective variables. They run metadynamics. They found that the transition states for the two are different in water solvent. It's 
specifically because of these steric effects, which you can guess here. The different steric effects being that in the Russian nerve gas case, a water molecule can stabilize a transition state, which allows the oxidation to occur more rapidly. So for the next example, talk about a water to ice phase transition. Here they're looking at a finite system of hexagonal water ice. Looking at the reversible melter. Trying to look at how crystal order and topological defects are related. So they have two different metadynamics calculations using three different collective variables. In their two different calculations, they use energy as a collective variable in both. So energy is a useful collective variable because obviously different metastable states will tend to have different energies. If you have a higher energy or a lower energy in a icing magnet, which is subject to a field, that tends to be how you distinguish the metastable states. So this is a natural collective energy. Um, and then for the other one, they were using an actual order parameter for the phase transition, which was more based on microscopic detail. So they have one order parameter, which is very microscopic, and one which is microscopic. And what they were able to see was that as they biased, say, away from the liquid, so they said, we've seen lots of these liquid configurations with tons of defects before. Um, why don't we try to make some more order in it? they found that the order would form nucleation sites, which would be somewhat stable. And then the nucleation cluster would get a little bit bigger, and the whole thing would crystallize. On the other hand, from the solid, you see the reverse. You see defects form. The defects aggregate. And then after a certain amount of aggregation, the nucleation is complete, and you see one. So go straight from that. And so this is hexagonal ice. So the topological microscopic order correctly that they're looking at is the number of five-membered rings. Hexagonal ice will have a lot of six-membered rings, six oxygens, hydrogen bonded to each other in a honeycomb throughout the ice. When you start forming defects, what happens is you get five-membered rings, right? Like seven-membered rings. So you could count either the five or the seven-membered rings. It's up to you to count five-membered rings. And we're trying to drive the creation of those subtle defects. So the next one, membrane permeation. Here, the researchers were interested in the diffusion of small drug molecules through lipid bilayers, possible lipid bilayers. And what they were interested in was how the conformation of the small drug molecule was related to where it was in the membrane. So for these, they did metadynamics calculations for each drug molecule. And they used as their collective variables the progress through the membrane using the distance of the center of mass of the molecule to the distance of the center of mass of the membrane, the projecting along the z-axis, the displacement of the distance as well. And then for their internal confirmation variables, they use dihedrals, describing the rotation of a side group off of these aromatic rings. And so what they saw was that in a hydrophilic environment, obviously, you have a different configuration that in this polyelectrolyte sort of environment and that there's a different configuration in here in hydrophobic environment. You're able to see how it's going right. So next, cytoskeleton growth function is another one. This one was actually from our group several years ago. It's talking about actin, which is one of the CMTS's big molecules. And you may recognize these things from Greg's talk uh, on Monday. He was talking about the DNA's binding loop, 
and how we needed to have multiple states within that CGB. This work is part of why we believe that, because we did metadynamics simulations on the loop and examined the folding down of the folding and saw the multiple metastable states underneath the force grain configuration. And also similarly, we're looking at nucleotide dependence of the dynamics of the protein. So not just ATP here, but also ADP and ADP plus inorganic phosphate. We're looking at the fluctuations of the cleft width here, which the nucleotide escapes through. Um, in all those three cases, with those different nucleotides bound. In this case, you can see very clearly how important it is to be focused on a few collective variables. Imagine trying to figure out how this affects the fluctuations of that by unfolding and refolding an actin triangle. You can't fold and unfold an actin triangle, at least we can't. So it's entirely impractical. It really drives home how important it is to focus on only a few collective variables, only what you're interested in. So what we're interested in is a constrained delivery, not a full unconstrained delivery in biological applications. The final one of these examples. This group was studying the folding of the protein G3. They were trying to examine all these states and just couldn't get the experimental NMR couplings out of their computational work. They didn't know why. But they knew that the NMR couplings were indicative of what was it, whatever was missing. So they were wondering, is our force field bound? You know, can we get the right thing? Or does the, the computational model we're using have the wrong NMR spectrum? Um, or is it a slow variant? To test if the NMR couplings, whatever those actually were, right? Is there a connection between all the electron density in the system and all the proton spins in the system. It's a very strange collective variable that you think of biasing. So they decided they would try it and see if biasing that, they could see whatever slow things were missing in their computational investigations previously, and if they could start seeing the full folding trajectory. And long story short, they could, but they couldn't, but they would have been published. Um, but it shows you that you can just take whatever you know about the system, plug that into a collective variable, and see if you're getting more exploration out of it, if you're exploring what you want, or if what you were seeing wasn't a sampling problem, but was really a problem with the physics of your world. So with that, are there questions about this? Are there questions about how you might apply this to a particular model you have in mind, or something that you have in mind could be a collective variable? Stop before going with thought experiments. Make sure that you have a clear picture of what you can do. Yes? Just a question about So, if you pick two, I mean, is it typical to run multiple metadynamics runs, I guess, with different starting parameters? Since let's say you have, let's say there's three collective variables that are important, but you only pick the two, right? So, if you, if you say that's a plane in three dimensional space, then if you change the one, variable that you're not looking at, you might get a totally different landscape. Yeah, they might. So you can do scans, and sometimes people will do this. It's not necessarily recommended, but if you start seeing something you don't want to see in the model, you can actually add a restraint. So you can say, I only want to sample this value of another collective variable. So you can do a combination of the sampling and the dynamics, and they fit together nicely. Questions like that? So it's like a, when there are uh, many dimensions to the system, uh, you pick up the dimensions, the reduced set of dimensions that you really care about, right? Exactly. Do you have to worry at all about the like the variables being correlated or just the, does it take care of that? 
It depends on what you mean by what you're worried about. If you want to worry about efficiency, you do need to worry about yeah, it. But it's, it won't like mess with the with slight like, advantage. No. It'll just make it much slower. What if you don't have any priori knowledge about the barriers? You don't know that, that you cannot use this, or is there a way to explore those? What would you mean by prior knowledge about the barrier? Let's say you want to study protein folding and state it here. They don't know what will be the transition state, or how would you get that? They, you need to use an experiment, or? In this case, they didn't need to know the transition state. Yeah. They only needed to know that there was a variable they weren't exploring. Yeah. And they did get that variable from experiment. So you need to have some knowledge. Some Otherwise, knowledge. Enough to choose a collected variable. You don't have to know what the transition state is, but you need to know something that can drive you across it. All right, then I'll go on talking about these thought experiments. So these were very high level. I wasn't going to be emphasizing the free energy you get out or how you choose the parameters. This will be about how you choose parameters. What the method is doing is I'm going to divide it into three parts. First, I'm just adding a single hill, looking very closely at what happens when you add a hill and how that is affecting the system. Next, adding an ensemble of hills. So if we could add all the hills at once, what would happen? How would we want to add those ensembles? If we're adding lots of small hills, you can see this as a as maybe being relevant to a mean field approximation, but we're doing very good sampling as we're adding hills. Um, and then finally, after doing that, after adding individual hills and adding all the hills at once, I'll talk about what happens when you add them staggered in series, because there are a few non visible effects, which you might notice bother you if you don't see them in the literature. I don't know sure. okay. For adding one hill, I want to answer a few questions. First, how does a hill push a simulation? So what determines how hard it pushes and how does it impact the design? Next, how does the hill flatten the surface? What does it mean to fill the well? How does that relate to the hill we're adding? Next, this is a sort of cheeky question, but what is the best hill to add? If you could add a hill, if you knew in advance what hill to add, which would it be? And also, what would be the worst case? What could you get wrong? So, just to remind you, the equation for the metadynamics, we're adding a Gaussian with a height h and a width ds at the state we're sampling. Sigma of t. And if we're using tempering, we have it with a slightly lower height based on the number of times it had been visited previously. And this is not exhaustive. In particular, this delta s can be a function of space. So you can have different hills sizes in different places. But I'm going to try to avoid that in the thought experiments because I want these to be simple in intuition. Right. So for the first one, just adding a new hill, how does it push a simulation? The easiest case to think of this is adding a hill to something that was already flat. You wouldn't want to do this, but let's say you've just about converged, it's approximately flat, adding a hill. What is going on? How is it pushing? So we're starting at the top. There's no bias. Go to one or the other. And only then do we see a push. So we add the hill, the bias is doing nothing. It only starts doing work after we've moved a little ways away from where we were sampling. This is important because it means that the metadynamics is not biasing the direction you're going in an equilibrium way. But it also tells you some things that I'll revisit later on about what can go wrong. So if you add a hill, 
might be expecting to see immediately whether or not it was an okay thing to do when you're running your simulation. But that's not true. You have to be careful because it will only actually kick in after a little while. So you'll have to look for whether or not your simulation has undergone some unphysical kick after a little while. So when you're debugging it, you don't look at exactly when you add the hole, but a little ways after when you add the hole. Um, another thing is that if you consider that this has inertia, what you're doing is essentially saying that whichever way I'm moving already, I'll keep moving, and I'll give myself a kick. It's just saying whichever way I'm moving, I'm going to move further, faster. Another thing is that if I were to add a hill which is entirely constant, I would never kick. I would never push it. So when I'm thinking about how much work I'm actually doing on the system and how fast I'm doing it, how I have to limit the forces I'm putting into the system, I need to think about the slope and not the height. You know, so I need to think about h over delta s, not just h. This is relevant because we think of these systems often as Brownian blockers. So they're just diffusing. It's as if they're in a viscous medium. They're just being dragged along. If they're in a viscous medium, then however hard you push it, you get a proportional displacement. But in fact, the systems we're studying, proteins, even water, they're viscoelastic. If you push harder, you'll get a different response than if you push slowly. So you have to tune the response so that you're getting a sort of dissipative response rather than a caging. You set up cages. It will be like corn starch and water. If you try to push the simulation at the right speed, you'll go right through, and you'll be fine. But if you try to push it a little bit too hard, then you'll see uh, shock waves say, go across your protein. You'll see non-local effects. You'll see uh, rattle. And this is what you have to be paying attention to to avoid those unphysical okay. So there's no limit on H. It's a limit on H over delta S. So delta S is very important. So the next thought experiment will be how to fill a well. So I'll consider two rough, so rough surfaces adding two hills of different sizes. The surface will have exactly one energy length scale. These are just sine waves. So this is the simplest case you can probably imagine. Just one length scale for all the net state states. Would be ideal. So you want to ask how does each hill cut the surface? Is it going to fill the well? I'll use the same surface to talk about what the best hill is in the worst. Okay. So if we add these two hills, we see these things come out. Clearly, the narrower hill, which is better matched to the roughness, better fills the well. This one instead adds to the bottom of the well, but it also adds to the barriers. So we can have our hills add to the barrier at the same time they're adding to the basin if the hill is too wide. And it comes from a rule which is kind of like what you may be familiar with in complex variables. So smooth plus smooth equals smooth, a smooth surface plus a rough surface is rough, and a rough surface plus a rough surface can be rough or smooth. It's like in complex variables when you have a real variable times a real variable, it's a real variable. If you have a real variable times a complex variable, it's a complex variable. If you have a complex variable times a complex variable, it can be either. But it has to be a very specific complex variable if you're going to get a real variable. So you have to have a very specific rough surface to get a smooth surface. All right. So that sets the optimal length scale for your simulation. But unfortunately, if you think about it, Again, um, this surface now has another length scale that's emerged. The roughness is disappearing. That means the length scale of the roughness is increasing. 
happen. So you would want your hills to become flatter as you're adding more and more hills. We have to have the scales change in time. <laughs> and this is directly related to why we have to use tempering and decrease the hill height. Because decreasing the hill height is increasing the length scale over which a certain amount of energy change has occurred. Okay. So we'll also revisit this later. It's not clear right here how you eventually fill this well and get a flat surface. We'll talk about that with the ensembles of hills and then we'll get this concludes that. And now for the best hill, it's just the negative of the free energy. If you knew the negative of the free energy, you would add it. Could be done. One step. It's not really practical. It doesn't really make sense to do this. If you already knew that, you wouldn't have done that. On the other hand, the worst hill you could add is anything like that, in that it didn't depend on where you were sampling, but that wasn't the exact negative for your energy. Because anything else, you're never going to correct. So you'll never get full accuracy. So to get robustness, you have to avoid this. You have to use only information that would be transferable, which you can really adaptively correct if you were wrong. So even though we say this is the best hill, it's not robust. It's, it's not a good strategy. And uh, it indicates that the really important thing when you're developing these methods is not to try to get something fancy which will converge as fast as possible but to get something that will be robust and give you accuracy in many cases. So with that, I'm finished with the one hill examples. Are there any questions about these examples? About adding a single hill to your system? Unclear. I guess I'll go ahead and begin talking about how to add ensembles of hills, or how to think about adding ensembles of hills. So the questions that I want to think about in this section are the stability of the final state. So if I were to get even sampling, then would I add hills in a way that would make the next sampling even? So would I add an even bias if I had even sampling? And how does it affect my nose? Slightly angry. And what happens at the edges of a simulation? So if you have even sampling up to an edge, then do you add a flat bias? What happens? If you were looking very closely at the examples um, I used to show that the metadynamics error goes to something which is model independent, those gray lines were actually widening towards the edges, so they were seeing more error near the edges, which deserves some explanation. And then the final one will be, can I flatten a feature thinner than my hills? So sometimes in the literature you'll see people talk about um, metadynamics as if it's creating a smooth free energy profile, as if it's uh, not getting the exact free energy profile. And I wanted to talk about a thought experiment here, which will demonstrate why that doesn't have to be the case, why metadynamics can get you an unsmooth free energy profile, even though it's not in smooth functions but also why you're probably not actually you're actually right. Okay. I'm going to begin by going into the stability question. Here we're going to assume we have a rough surface. We have some sampling. We added a bunch of hills. It came flat. Now what happens after we add hills to the now flat simulation? 
two cases that I want to think about. One is if these are just exemplars from a distribution that actually is completely even. So we have completely constant sampling. Alternatively, if these are actually what we have sampled, so some statistical noise, it's roughly even but not quite. What happens in each case, you probably visualize it immediately. You integrate a constant function, you add hills on a constant function, you get a constant back. It's a convolution of a Gaussian with a constant function. You get a constant function. On the other hand, if you're doing a convolution of a Gaussian with a series of delta functions, you get a bunch of hills that are added. It's rough. So you can say that the even sampling does lead to an even bias. So we will add a constant if we were sampling a constant. But on the other hand, if we had any statistical fluctuations, they will not be fully average. They'll be smoother. The bias that we add will be smoother than those fluctuations, but it will not be fully smooth. So even if we were to get flat sampling at some point in our simulation, this is telling us that we would be move away from that to something a little bit rougher, just through statistical models. This is exactly what they were seeing with the error saturation formula, the error saturation phenomenon is why you have to make these hills smoother and smoother as you advance your simulation. So that every time you get flat, you go away from it less due to statistical norms. Um, and here I have accidentally introduced something we haven't talked about. Um, in metadynamics, we talk about it as if it's a single trajectory, but you can actually run multiple at a time and everyone will see the bias from everyone. So you can have a trajectory which has many different states at the time. And you add hills and add them. If you add infinite of them, that's when you could get an exact stable increase. But if you have a finite number of these walkers, I haven't gone over the virtual subjects, but too much time. Then you have to temper. So let me move on. And then what happens is we have a simulation in which we want sampling only in a specific region. So the metadynamics is designed to sample the entire region. We will be trying to sample out here, beyond the barrier. Um, so it's trying to do that. It's an interesting question to ask. How it does that. If you have flat sampling except for a hard cutoff, what happens then? The answer is that we have a bunch of Gaussians being added. We're going to assume this is a constant function, these are exemplars or delta functions. Um, we have a, con a convolution of a rectangular sampling distribution with a Gaussian hill convolution of the rectangular function with the step function with the Gaussian will give us an error function plus a constant. So what we actually see is this. We see a small well develop at the edge. And this will be one half the value of that in the center. And so we see that if we get flat sampling with a wall, then in the future, the sampling will not be flat, but will be attracted to the wall. So you cannot simply run metadynamics with walls and expect to get the exact negative of the free energy as your bias. You have to have something different. And there are a number of corrections that have been proposed. Um, for some, you add a hill not only here, but you also add another hill reflected across the boundary. Um, there are more principled ways of doing it based on letting the delta S parameter change depending on where you are. Um, actually, two groups at U Chicago came up with a correction formula for this independently. Um, the Pablo group came with it 
came up with it about a, a couple of months before our group did, but it was still interesting to see. This is a worthwhile fun experiment. You can correct these just by trying to decide what size of hill you would want to add here in order to make this flat. So the next one. The question, how do we get a thin feature from a thick feature? How do we get a feature thinner than our hills? So in thinking about this, we know how to turn a Gaussian into a thinner function if we're working with convolutions. And we've seen in every previous case that the bias that we add is a convolution of the Gaussian with the sample distribution. So we know what function we would want to use to evolve with this Gaussian to get that. But it would go negative. So we would add a hill here, and we would subtract a hill here, and add a hill here, and subtract a hill here, add a hill a little further on. So we keep on going in these shells, adding and subtracting progressively smaller hills. But in metadynamics, we only add hills. So you can't directly do that. But on the other hand, you can get the same effect if you're willing to add a constant offset to the bias. So instead, you say that a thin feature plus a wide base is equal to the convolution of the Gaussian with this complete positive sample distribution. So what it says is that to get this thin feature, we have to not only sample where the well is, is correctly, but also we have to sample everywhere else in very specific ratios. We have to have less sampling right here. And so when we want to flatten something that's thin, it gets very slow. We can do it. We can eventually get the exact free energy. And what we're getting from metadynamics is not a smooth free energy. But at finite times, we are getting a smooth free energy because we haven't been able to do this perfect sampling. Yet. And what this tells you is that it's very important to get the thickness approximately right, because otherwise you're going to be wasting a lot of time. You're going to have to do redundant sampling all over the entire range of all the variables that you're getting at once in order to undo your mistake by choosing a focus to win. So it's better to undershoot the hill with. Okay. So that concludes the section on ensembles. Are there any questions about this section? Yes? So it seems like this is the method is extremely channel on the sort of hills you add. So is there any reason why you can't just like sample the well you're in for a while and then say, okay, now I compute a free energy service and then add these hills? No. And in fact, that was done um, in something called reconnaissance metadynamics, which I wasn't going over in this talk, but I'm glad you brought it up. Um, so what they do is they have a very high dimensional Space. They have a bunch of collective variables. They let themselves get trapped in a metastable state. And then um, they assume that the metastable state is roughly Gaussian shaped, the depth is. So then they create an estimate for what that Gaussian shape is and use the parameters of the Gaussian to get themselves out of it. I mean, it looks like if you know the free energy surface, you know what the optimal is. Right. But then you don't know the free energy surface. Well, yeah, but you can you can get an estimate of like what these slopes are going to Yeah. There is also a version in which you are constantly estimating the diffusion tensor at every point, and you add hills based on the size of that diffusion, which is very simple. Any more questions about this? Thank you for that. Okay. If not, I'll go on to the final section.
talk about adding series inputs. So specifically two problems which are common or that you might fear. Not actually that. Um, what happens if you add hills too quickly? What does the too quickly mean? And what happens if you've chosen the wrong collective variable and it's not actually that slow? You can't get a PMF along this because something else is going on in addition to motion along this collective variable. So first let me jump straight into the adding hills too fast. Here we consider we have a little point, we got a hill, moves, we got another hill. It's still on one side of the previous hill, so it's still biased to move in the same direction. We move it a little bit, we have another hill. Now, it's still on the, that side of those two hills. If we kept on adding hills, we just keep on pushing ourselves in one direction. We have the direction that every hill is pushing, correlated. We would get something called a hill circuit. That's just a wave. Um, so this is something that you can recognize in a simulation. Pretty, pretty. You can see that you are always going one direction and then going the other direction. So you know if you show some parameters. Um, another thing that can happen, I was alluding to earlier, is it can't even surf. So if you just stay there and then add another hill, and you're still on top of the other one. You just keep on adding hills, and you don't realize that you're pushing too hard yet because you haven't seen any push, because the push comes with a delay. You just keep on adding hills and hills and hills until finally you get a little bit off the peak, and then suddenly you have a giant energy input and your system will have crazy caging effects. You'll see these shock waves going through your protein or something. And you don't want to see that because what can happen is if you're only looking at the evolution along a few collective variables, then if you kick yourself into a metastable state, which is not described well by those collective variables, then you can't get back. It's like you've gotten into a lobster trap. So if you kick yourself in somewhere, and then you diffused around in there, and now the path back home is no longer the path to get there. You can't kick the same way to get in as you could to get out. And the lesson is really power input. At the maximum power input should be lower than what the system can naturally dissipate. So you don't get too many arguments. This is sort of that diffusion in terms of Brownian dynamics. If you're thinking of it in terms of Brownian dynamics. On the other hand, if it's not purely Brownian, if there are memory effects in caging, then you need to um, consider that. You, know, that you may have non neighbor response. And this, again, is about the slope. So after you've chosen the width of the future that you want to see in your simulation, then you choose the height based on this slope and making sure that the power input maximum is not too high. Right. So then going back to the motivated collective variable example, what if I accidentally thought about it the wrong way? I thought the barrier was along the other one. So now I'm using x as my collective variable instead of y in that event. So now I'm increasing exploration something that was already pretty easy to explore and not aiding myself in getting over this barrier at all. So this is a problem that can come up in uh, any free energy method. It is an umbrella sound that what will happen is that your windows will just not equilibrate. Uh, maybe some of them will have an event across the event and some won't. So you'll actually get different PMFs that you're sampling in different windows, which is a problem. What then the dynamics will do is it will increase the exploration here, and then you'll see an event where you cross, and then it will start exploring this PMF and acting like it needs to flatten this PMF on this side. So what you see is that you have a little point being sampled on a zero bias surface, and then the bias flattens out 
the well on your side of the barrier. It keeps on doing that. You just keep on getting flat sampling. You think you've converged maybe. But then suddenly you see a little peak growing in a corner of your view. And then you sample this and sample this. This now becomes just another uh, another well that you want to escape. Say. And then you completely flatten out what you had discovered on the other side and only get the PMF conditional on being on the other side. So whereas with umbrella sampling you might get different things in different windows, uh, with metadynamics you'll tend to get one PMF corresponding to a single value of a orthogonal variable and then it'll change and you'll get a different one. And you'll be able to see this pulsing in the free energy. Even though it seems like something has gone wrong here, this is one of my favorite things about metadynamics, actually, because you kind of know when you've gone wrong. You can see that things aren't working. You can see that you're missing something. <coughs> you can maybe see what it is. So um, instead of just trying to bang your head and body, choosing the parameters for the umbrella sampling, um, you can realize that it's a collective variable problem very early on instead of a hill width problem or a hill size problem. Hill height. And this is worth thinking a little bit more about. Um, concept of equilibrium is always subtle. You're always thinking about a constrained equilibrium in any chemistry you do. Just imagine trying to include all variables in a chemical simulation. Think about including the nuclear strong force in your simulation and getting complete sampling. You would need to input an activation energy, roughly comparable to a nuclear bomb, and your system would fuse and you'd get a lump of fire. That's the equilibrium for basically any chemical system if you're going to include nuclear strong forces. So the constrained equilibrium is principle. This is the important thing that you want to study. We never want to study all of the environmental variables. A great example is the recent um, controversy about liquid liquid um, coexistence of water. And just in the middle of the um, Where uh, David Chandler was recently in one of his papers showing that what people thought had been a uh, phase transition in density. So multiple different density phases of water was actually just a non equilibrium artifact because people were not equilibrating on a crystal order parameter for the ice at the same time that they were equilibrating the density. So if you have a partially equilibrated crystal order, you appear to have a density transition. Otherwise, yes. All right, so to conclude, the carefully limit power input due to the bias, control the slope of the hills, and rate addition to limit this. You will look out for heterogeneous fluctuations, you're going to look out for the diffusion constant being very different in the transition state and in your basin. Hills must adapt as the simulation progresses because the scale of your heterogeneities in the surface change as you fill them up. You always look out for orthogonal variables. Look out for pulsing around convergence. Define very early what is fast and what is forbidden. So you know what is fast, and that says what you are um, not worried about sampling more of, what is forbidden. That's what you don't want to see in your simulation, or what you might want to restrain yeah. if you start seeing it, or what would be a sign of things going wrong if you didn't start to see it. So maybe you added too much power and it started to be shunted to unphysical pathways if you're driving your um, Your rotomeric states are most of the future. Things left out for time, we are already out of time. So. Uh, Concrete implementations. First of all, we'll discuss one this afternoon. Go through an example. That uh, current frontiers that we haven't talked about. There's a lot of work on how to use more CDs effectively. The reconnaissance metadynamics that I got to bring up because of your earlier question is one of those. Um, Work on how to choose and design CVs is another. So the NMR 
CV was a very recent one, which is notable, using like string methods to create string collective variables is another. And I also haven't gone over how it fits in with other methods, especially, except to say that so with those restraints, you can do a combination of umbrella sampling and then do metadynamics within the umbrella windows, if you'd like. And that works well. There are other very nice things you can do, like use replica exchange with the metadynamics, They're very complementary. Over that, but those are in the literature. Those are better covered in the literature. These intuition building thought experiments are less apparent in the literature, so they were what I chose to emphasize this. Final summary is theoretically simple. Just buy yourself away from previously visited states. You're saying what you previously visited using an address, which is only describing a few collective variables, and you're decreasing the rate of bias. It's also practically convenient. Parameters we chose. We didn't have to worry about where all the windows were, what every window's width was. Then we have a width of the hill, height of the hill, and a rate of And then the implementation is actually not so bad. It's nice to be able to imagine doing a simulation and figuring out what the free energy looks like, and then adding a bias that looks like that, but it's, it takes thinking. It takes sequential um, steps in an algorithm which have more involved logic than just add a hill or a grant. It's very simple to implement this. It's very, very robust. And then it also fails early and fails instructively with a bucket of variables or with these. Um, if you've added a bias which drives into different physical things, then you quickly get to see that you're not getting what you with the umbrella sampling or comparable methods, we often waste a lot of time figuring out that something. So, thank you for your time.